Okay, I'll mention this. Al brought up a question last week about the um, about the word lambano. If you remember, lambano means in Greek to take. It's a verb. And I said that um, what I mentioned in was I said, okay, Strong's, Vines, and Woodhouse are the standard. And this is correct. So I went back to look it up. Uh, Al, Al was kind. He didn't do it. But I looked it up. In, if you look at Strong's, now Strong's is known for, anybody know what Strong's expertise was? Hebrew. Languages. Hebrew, what? Languages. Well, languages, but specifically Hebrew. So Strong's expertise was in Hebrew. The reason we have the difference is we have Strong's. Strong's does Hebrew and Greek. And we have Vines. Vines is exclusively Greek. And then Woodhouse. Woodhouse is classical Greek. So those are the three standards we use in dictionaries for these different languages. When I looked up the Strong's, it said to take, comma, receive, with no etymology. I mean, if you go look at the Strong's input for Lambano, it's very short. Strong's is Hebrew, but he also did a little Greek. If you go look at Vines, Vines this is the consolidated vines and strongs when I give you the definitions here. Like I said, they're kind of, but we know that lambano, the etymology of lambano is to grasp. So we translate it generally to take, but the proper translation is really to grasp. But you can get where in a um, accusative or a dative case, I'm sorry, I'm using difficult stuff here, but you can see that in, in an accusative or dotive case, uh, accusative, dotive, um, accusative, I walked the dog. I was given the book by him. By him is dotive. So to take in the dotive case would look similar to a receive, although it's not. It would be more like I grasped the book from him, right? That would be the dot of case in the Greek. So lambano always means to take or to grasp. Our translators don't do us, don't help us sometimes. And I mentioned the fact that if you remember, did Martin Luther have any expertise in Greek? Did he have? Uh, according to Pastor, yes. I asked. According to according to Martin Luther, he didn't. He, he had a lot of help doing his Greek and his Hebrew because he wasn't an expert. He was an expert in Latin, Latin, Latin and German. As a matter of fact, his German translation came basically, well, where he, tra he said where he translated it from. The German translation he made came from the Latin. It's a do it. So he had help getting his translations, but he was not, he, would, he wrote he wasn't an expert in Hebrew and Greek. He had help. And most of all the translators did. So they were Latin speakers and Latin experts and read in Latin. So when he did his translation, by the way, he was an expert in German. So his translation into German is pretty good. But if you ever wonder, I don't know if you, have you ever read his German translation? I have. The German translation is very similar to the King James in lots of ways. As a matter of fact, a lot of the verbiage is really similar to King James. So you wonder who was borrowing what, right? I think King James came a little bit before. Did King James come a little bit before? No, maybe it was after, right? A little bit after. But they were borrowing each other's translational kind of translations. Because, you know, Calvert and all those other guys, right, were kind of in that, that same area. Well, did King James also come from the Latin? Um, King James supposedly, okay, this is what, when the King James was translated, and, and by the way, uh, Martin Luther said he got help when he did his translations. He wasn't doing, he didn't do it himself. So, right, translations done by a singular person are considered bad. You don't want a single person translating anything. Because what would happen? Yeah, their own personal ideas and it would get involved in the writing. So you don't want that at all. So most of the time, all, well, all, all, all translations, good trans... Merrick, what do we call that? We have a name for that when it's a translation done by a single person. Paraphrase? Um, 
Yeah, a paraphrase. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't we do that? We call it a paraphrase. I believe that's correct. When it's done by a singular person, we call it a paraphrase because it's that person's opinion of what it said because translations are very difficult. But Martin Luther had help doing his translations. And, like, and also, remember the King James? What did they say they did? They got together a group of scholars. And the group of scholars started with the, the Hebrew, and they started with the, with the Greek. Now, actually, they didn't totally start with the Hebrew. You know what they started with, right? Septuagint. The Septuagint, yes. The Septuagint is the basis. And the reason they did is because they all knew that all the New Testament quotes came from the Septuagint. And a Greek scholar can read the Septuagint and have no problems, right? That's why we went back. Do you guys remember? We went back uh, in the NIV even. And originally it says, And a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And guess what it said in Isaiah? And a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The word virgin is bulima, bluma. I haven't said it well. Bulma, bulma. And it means, bulma means literally an unmarried woman. Well, an unmarried woman meant a virgin in Hebrew. It's just they didn't have a word for virgin like Greek does. Parth Parthenon is a word in Greek for virgin. So Greek has a word for it. Hebrew doesn't have a word for it. And so guess what? When our modern translators retranslated the Hebrew, what did they say? And a young woman shall conceive. That's what happens. In the past, when you translate the Septuagint, guess what the Septuagint says? Parthenon, virgin. Because the, the scholars who were translating the Hebrew into the Greek knew what the word meant. But our modern scholars fixed it for us. And even in some modern translations, guess what you see in the New Testament? And a young woman shall conceive when they quote it, right? Yeah, it was one of the big um, anti-revised standard versions. Our teachers did not care for that because the dad didn't say version. I don't care for it, but I think it gets deeper than that because, <laughs> you know. I just remember that that was a big argument, you know. Stick to the King James. Don't, don't get that revised standard version, even if it's easier to read. Well, who cares about the King James? Stick to the Greek. The big deal is, you know why? Do you know why the Greeks? Okay, think about this. I know that I'm going like, you know, we're not sticking to topic. We're, to, we're in topic of translations, which is part of what we're studying. But why do you think the Greeks have a word for Parthenon, a word for virgin, and the Hebrews don't? It's a huge cultural thing because the Greeks are concrete. So the Greeks want you to know the state of that woman. To them, a virgin is important because they had uh, priestesses, right? They had priestesses and oracles, and they were called Parthenon. They also had matrons that were um, matrons in the temples who were married. And they were not virgins. They were not Parthenon. Parthenon women who were virgins could do certain things in temples in Greece. In the Hebrew, the word, uh, what's it, you got the word correct? Boma? Uh, Boma. No, I think you're right. I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I don't have it written down, but I think it's Boma. It's very close. Boma literally means a woman who is not a wife, it, a young woman, but it's translated young woman because in the euphemistic society of the Hebrew culture, it wasn't, okay, everywhere in the Torah, is there any restriction for virgins doing anything? No. No. They, if you're not a virgin, you can still get married. You can go in the temple. You can do truma. The big deal for truma is you have to have the mikvah, right? But there's no restrictions on, there's no reason to be a virgin other than it's a virgin, right? But... Bulma, the word means young woman. The assumption is when a woman is not married that she is a virgin. A virgin. That's an assumption in their culture. <laughs> but remember, they have problems in their culture. You know that, right? Everyone does. <laughs> well, all, this is very interesting because culturally, 
you, you know, okay, you know that the, the north, that, okay, I'd say it's a very, you know, you know that the cultures in, in the um, European cultures had less problem, they had less problems with adultery than southern cultures did. You know that, right? This, and I'm, not, I'm not telling you something. If you go look this up on the internet, you'll find this. This is like a, this is con considered a cultural and social truism. You know why? In the northern cultures, if you got turned out of the house, <coughs> what happened to you? You died. You died. They had very short growing seasons, very hard work, and you, if, if you, it was cold. Yeah. On the other hand, remember when we talked about sex is marriage, marriage is sex? If a father could not marry off his daughter, it was not uncommon for them to leave them in a field. Whenever you see it, they're leaving a woman, especially in a field, that is the exact opposite culturally of their culture. It means socially that woman has been ejected from the household. A woman or anyone, a child ejected from the household in a southern climate is at risk for rape, murder, other things, slavery, but guess what? If it's 98.6, you're going to stay 98.6. You're not going to die, you know, from cold and exposure, right? You might die from lack of food, but even then, they point out, uh, people point out culturally, in a lot of southern climes, guess where the food is? Everywhere, right? It grows on the trees. It's very easy to, to get. So, in climates, in, in, I'll leave you to go and study this. I actually had a class on it one time in the military, believe it or not. They are talking about this from a cultural standpoint of how to understand different cultures for the work I was doing. But we, if you look at cultures, they are different for lots of reasons. But the Oriental cultures had problems with this. And it comes from their culture. We can get it deep into it. But anyway... The word, um, the word is Alma. 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 Yeah, where did I get Bulma? Alma. Bulma. It's close. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to chase a rabbit for just a minute. Uh, in, in regards to the Revised Standard Version, yeah. did, um, some, sometime or other they must have gone back and fixed it. Because mine's a Revised Standard Version, and in Matthew it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Okay, then they did fix it. Because that was a big objection, I remember. Because I, I was in school and it came out, you know. Oh, what does it say in Isaiah 714? <laughs> but in Isaiah 714, it says, it should say, and a young woman, it's a revised standard. And my NIV says that too. The NIV says, a young woman shall conceive, I believe. So, um, what do you think? Well, I guess it would be a little rabbit hole to ask, but was there a virgin that conceived back in? Isaiah's day as a sign in that time as well was Mary the second virgin. <laughs> oh, that is a great question because that you know, um, that is a great question. And what I be I believe I believe that and and we haven't studied Isaiah and look Hebrew I like Greek Greek is easy it's concrete when you start digging into Hebrew. I mean, I, I love doing Ruth, but if you remember Ruth, it was, whoa, dude, they are saying things in Ruth, and you go, and you're blushing, because it's, you know, very euphemistic. Isaiah is the same way, but even worse, because it's prophecy. But the Turbingen school, I believe this is what happened. I believe the Turbingen school brought up this concept of, um, if you remember Turbingen school, Okay, this, this is a rabbit track. I don't want to go too deep into Turbingen School. The Turbingen School started out because they originally could not find much archaeological evidence in the 1830s for the Bible. When they first invented archaeology, the first thing they started looking for in archaeology was biblical stuff. That's the society and culture they were in. They cared more about that than anything else. When they first started looking in the 1830s, their techniques were, weren't very good, and guess what they didn't find? A lot of the evidence they wanted to seek. Well, as archaeology kept going, guess what they found? Lots of archaeological evidence. But it's only in the modern era we're finding, like, really lots. But that Turbingen School started because of that. And Turbingen School saw a disconnect between natural theology 
and what they were seeing in archaeology and the world. So mm -hmm. Turbingen theology said, and one of the big things in Turbingen ideas in theology is that it doesn't matter what it says, it doesn't matter the accuracy or facts of the Old or New Testament, what matters is the message in it. And, they, and the, a new idea that was promulgated by forever in natural theology, when it says in Isaiah a prophecy, it was assumed to be a prophecy. Turbingen School said, miracles don't exist. They don't have to exist. Even though miracles are in every ancient piece of literature, from Josephus to Caesar to Hippocrates to Theodocles to Pliny to Socrates, we don't need miracles because they don't really exist. We're, we're empirical and scientific today, so we don't believe in miracles. So therefore, there can't be prophecy. prophecy. So the Turbingen School was the first ones to say, for us, thank you, very good. I, I wish we got rid of the whole school. Uh, it was Lutherans, I'm sorry to say. But the Turbingen School's idea was we have to reinterpret all prophecy as occurring before. So therefore, there is no prophecy. You don't have to worry about miracles. And it doesn't matter in Turbingen School of Theology because I don't need to worry about it, right? I don't need a miracle. I don't need truth. I don't need archaeology. Because it doesn't matter if Jesus... It, it doesn't matter if Jesus was God, or he was born of a virgin, or he died, or was resurrected. What matters? The message. Well, yeah, the, what you think about it. Well, you know, you may be imagining... Uh, Turbingen School, I think, is totally whack. But, you know, they're... They have led, you, you know, Turbingen School is why we have our, why our seminaries are the way they are. Turbingen School is why there's an uh, uh, ELCA church, and they, ha and they believe the way they do. Turbingen School is why we got away from the historical legal method, by the way. But so guess this, what? Is this like the beginning of, uh, uh, oh, shoot, forgot the word, gospel reductionism? Hmm. Turbingen School, indeed, is the beginning of what we call today gospel reductionism. They invented Q. Turbingen School is the inventors of the idea of Q as a manuscript. There is no evidence for Q. There is no, there is no Q, okay? Uh, I, I have a copy of somebody who tried to make up a Q. But Turbingen School is the reason we are where we are. A lot of our thought and thinking in Christianity has come out of Turbingen School. As a matter of fact, every college you go to, what will they tell you about the New Testament? Well, it didn't happen. It's made up. It, it, it was written in the second century, right? It was written by the church. Uh, Brown, that brown dude said, oh, yeah, it was written by the church in the second century. They just made it up. And, and they never thought Jesus was God. Even though they take away the vowels, or the, you know, the vowels out of Jesus' name in a lot of the early manuscripts, they didn't believe it was God, right? And, and it, he was only God until the Nicene Creed. You ever heard that? Until the Council of Nicaea, they never thought Jesus was really God. But then you have the Apostles' Creed and the Anastasian Creed. Oh, oh but that's okay. Don't you ignore it. It, it. It's, you know, right? And guess what? The more they dig into archaeology, what do they find? More and more and more evidence. Yeah. Back to Isaiah, though. What, so they say, well, that just means like a young woman had a son back then. I don't know. But for us, what, what do we, I mean, for a more conservative, not theologically whacked yeah. <laughs> belief, you know, what was there maybe a virgin birth back then, too? Or do we no. really know? No, but it does say in, in the, my Bible anyway, that it was a virgin. That's in um, Isaiah. Because, because the, the virgin scientific. will be with child and will give birth to a son. Right. If it doesn't... You know, the context of that particular chapter, when I was doing some personal Bible study on Isaiah recently, I, was, I looked on the internet on a bunch of different sites, like, what do people say about this? And nobody really knows, but um, the context of that sign that was being given then was like, you know, he was going to give a sign for this time period, you know, something was going to happen, and for it to happen, you know, 600 years later, or however long it was, you know, wouldn't have made any sense because everyone would have been dead and no one would have been there to see it. So, 
I don't know. Well, it, I just sort of was like, well, I guess we don't really know, but. This, this is why I think this, this kind of class and studying you know, the language is so important because um, we see, like for example, a lot of the stuff we've seen, like when we looked at Matthew and we looked at uh, Mark, the, a lot of the stuff that we think is prophecy from the words of Jesus aren't really prophecy. They're, they're what is happening in that era. And many times, I think a lot of times, for example, um, if, if you ever study Revelation, especially in the language, you'll see that Revelation does probably not apply. 90% of it applies to their time and not to future kind of stuff. But what is, what is important to me is rejecting, we got to reject Turbingen School, okay? Natural theology is the way to go. Martin Luther was nat in the natural theology. All natural, natural theology says that God revealed himself in the world. He did it through nature. He did it through history. He did it through science. God reveals himself in the world. And the gospel is natural theology. In other words, I have historical documents. We're studying one, right? That point to these facts. That's natural theology. Turbingen School says it doesn't matter what the facts are. My theology is based on, as a matter of fact, it's based on the word to me is anathema. Faith. The Greek word is pistis. And we're about to get into the pistis chapter. The pistis chapter. And I think you're, 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 you'll be blown away by how beautiful it is, especially when it's not faith. When you see what it actually says, as a matter of fact, and this is our transition, we are moving, remember, in the Hebrews right now, the big issue is law. And the big issue is what do we do about worship, and what do we do about sacrifice, and what do we do about our structure. And Ellen brought up a beautiful thing last week. She mentioned to me, and I, I, I want to pass it to you. Just think about it. How long have these people been worshiping the way they've been worshiping in, okay, we say this is after 70 AD. I believe, I, I think we can prove that Hebrews was written after 70 AD, after the destruction of the temple. How long have these people been worshiping in Jerusalem before 70 AD? Since the return from Babylon? No, before then. No. Since Solomon. Oh. Since Solomon. Okay. Well, even before then, because the tabernacle was there before then. Well, the Jews have been, but how about the Christians? How about Teen Hodos? <coughs> Jesus well, died in... Not yeah, 30, 40, 40 years, 30 years. Yeah, they've been worshipping this way. Well, first of all, the Jews have been worshipping this way since the tabernacle, right? The Torah tells them what to do. But all these people, who? what are they? Teen Hodos. They're Jews. They're Teen Hodos. They're Jews. But Teen Hodos has been worshiping this way for 30 years at least. If 30 years is your whole lifetime in this church, this church hasn't been here for 30 years. And we're already st stuck in a, you know, not, I'm not going to say a rut, but we're stuck. We do our worship the way we do our worship, and we've been doing it for a long time, right? So if I took you and moved you to an entirely different area where now there's no temple, well, there is a temple, but it's an illegal temple. And now I say, what are you going to say? How do we worship? Our worship has been totally destroyed, the way we worship, right? Before we went to the temple every day to do the Thanksgiving sacrifice, and we had our Thanksgiving sacrifice. Now there's an illegal temple. Now how do I do this? You can relate, can't you? I mean, just think, if, if I pulled you out of your roots and you went to another church and it was a totally different type of church, right? We're lucky because the Lutheran churches generally do it similar, in, but even in then. How many have gone to different Lutheran churches? They do something different and you go, well, that's a little different, right? And, and, you're, and you're a little spike, and, and, you're, and you have to calm down your hair because, like, well, that's okay. That's okay, right? It's biblical. But, right? <laughs> I know you do that. I know you do. You don't have to confess. You don't have to confess, but I know. <laughs> okay, here's the words, and here's a really long word. A-N-A-S-T-R-E-P-H. 
O M E N O N. And this part is uh, this part is basically the declension. It's phia or A I. Phomia. Phomia. This word is astropho. Anastropho. Anastropho from Anna. Anna is the preposition means up. Specifically up. Um, and strepho. Strepho means specifically a turn. <coughs> turn. Means, and this is pretty simple, it's a verb meaning to overturn. Overturn. And the reason I bring it up because we see it translated, okay, it's translated in the King James as abide, behave oneself, behave self, have conversation, live, overthrow, overthrow is close, pass, return, return's pretty good, be used. Hmm. Is that overturn in a legal sense or in a physical sense? Like um, overturn a car. Overturn, it's Greek. So it's got to be physically to turn something it's over. The word that was used Yes, yes. Now it can mean to return. It can mean to return, but it's a, it's it's a um, uh, it's a verb. It it can imply to busy oneself, to remain and live. These are implications. But I tell you, remember, you gotta be cautious with implications, because Greeks are concrete. So. 90% of the time, unless in context, if in context you see it, you know, pointing to something else, you might be able to put it within a context. That's what our translators kind of tried to do. <clears throat> but I just point that out. Here's another one. Uh, with this U at the front, so it's an H-U sound, H-U-P-A-R, this is X-I-Z, um, I. V, I, N, hooparaxin, um, hooparaxin, hooparaxis, hooparaxis, it's a hoopy word, I love the hoopy words, hoopy means under, under, and the other word, let's see, hoopy, uh, comes from, and acromei, which is a verb, acromei, archko, archko means first, under first, basically, um, and what this means is, you see, I, I put it. I tried to put it in uh, in bold so you see it. It means ex, extensi, extensi or proprietorship, proprietorship, uh, proprietorship. Ship. Okay, that's complex, right? Proprietorship. It means that you. It means that things are under your control. So, for example, a merchant proprietorship has. It's a verb meaning that they have control of their goods. Um, is, this and what's is this military? Is that <laughs> not so much. The King James, you notice, translates it as uh, goods or substance, which is pretty close. It literally means goods under your control. And you, and you see why there's a problem, right, in the ancient world? Right? If this is mine and I leave it, and somebody takes it in the ancient world, what do I do? Yeah, I lost it. It's gone. Things have to stay under your proprietorship because there's no police. Right. right? There's no police. There's, there's, you know, there is law. And the law says, thou shalt not steal. But then what do you got to do? I got to go to court, accuse somebody, la, 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 right? And so in the ancient world, how did you keep your possessions? You held on to them, right? Because if you didn't... Or had like a slave or something keeping track of them, like protecting them. Exactly. Well, or, or something, right? Something. You're hired, your, your, your family, your hired bodyguards, right? Whatever. You had somebody holding on to them. Uh, that's why, by the way, and I want to point that out, why do you think they had gynecaeums? Because the women. they wanted to protect their women because a woman out in the street was liable for a kidnapping, rape, you know? A slave on the street, and by the way, if you let your slaves just go wandering around, what was likely to happen to them? They get borrowed, and they did this. We know this because you read in the books. 
You know, a slave is going to do something, an errand, right? And somebody stops the slave and says, okay, I want you to go do this for me. And what recourse does a slave have? And then if, you're, if the slave is late, you'll probably beat them because they didn't do what they're supposed to do. I mean, this is not a very happy society in lots of ways. Although, you know, um, sometimes our society is a little bit messed up too. Anyway, let's look at Hebrews 10. Yeah, we just we have different problems, right, in our society. What's that? And the internet too? Um, all right, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of work up to this. Um, remember we had this, we had some pretty complex stuff, and we are looking at 30 plus. So let me see where I want to start. Um, let's, let's start with, um, well, probably, I think 29. I'm not going to delve into 29 because we went through this before. Uh, 29, I told you. Uh, the 29 says in the, in the NIV, How much more severely do you think a man's desires to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? And I warned you, the more words added, the more complex the terms, the more fitting the translators have done. In other words, translators fitting stuff in. Literally, and, and this is the tra a literal translation how much more evil vindication think deemed entitled the trampled down path of the Son of God. The trampled down path of the Son of God is Teen Hodos, by the way. Who led the blood of the covenant, who made holy the common and insulted the breath of graciousness, the spirit of graciousness. So, as remember, what we were looking at is, I told you, you got people in Teen Hodos at this moment that are in Alexandria, because that's where we think this was written to, and they got they got a foot in both camps, right? You got some of the people that are going to the temple illegally doing the, the Mosaic sacrifices because they did it in Jerusalem, and that's what they're doing. The leaders of the, the Hebrews is written to all these groups, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Hebrews, that are teen hodos for the purpose of helping them understand how they should worship. So I don't think this is an attack against them. This is a cautionary point that they're making to them about, okay, you shouldn't be sacrificing in the false temple of the Alexandrians, right? And also, you shouldn't be closing yourself up in the epi-synagogue. The epi-synagogue is the word they were using for their mixed synagogue of all the believers of the teen hodos. So they're saying, don't just sit there with your family because that's the only place you have to go, right? Go out into the community, spread the gospel, and keep living life the way you're living. And that is where we get to. So... In, the, in 30 it says, For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. And we parsed this already. The reason I wanted to re-mention this is in 30 it says, Assigning a reason, we who spoke vindication, Assigning a reason, we see who spoke vindication is mine. I will requite good or evil, argues curios. And what's more, curios distinguishes his own people. And the point I made last week was, remember, this is a quote from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, it doesn't say curios. It says Yahweh. So in other words, the author is directly saying that Jesus Christ, again, is directly saying that Jesus Christ is God. I also want to further point out that it doesn't say vengeance is mine. It says vindication is mine is mine. Vengeance is a totally different thing than vindication. Vindication means... I'll be proved right. Yeah, I told you so. Yeah. Or, or even, even more, vindication... Okay, when, and I'm, gonna, I'm doing, using this example on purpose. You go into your mommy, and your mommy's, and you say, Mommy, Mommy, I skinned my knee. And she says, Were you supposed to be riding your bike? No, I fell off my bike. And Mommy goes... See? Or on the other hand, you know, 
Mommy could be, okay. Mommy, mommy, look, I brought, I brought you, I brought you an apple. And mom says, of course, maybe you shouldn't have a skin knee at the time, but what? She says, thank you, I love you, right? So vindication can be positive, but it's never negative, is it? Vindication is really never, never negative. It depends on who's vindicating and who's in trouble, right? right? <laughs> now, let's the look. Is, the, the truth is coming out. The truth is coming out. But, uh, but it's much different than vengeance, right? It's very different than vengeance. And, of course, remember, this is Septuagint. So we use that quote, and I showed you that quote in, did, did we go through the quote? Yeah, okay, I don't think we did. This is from Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 32. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Let's, I'll start at the beginning. In Deuteronomy 32, it starts, Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Um, and then it goes on and on and on and on. And the part that we're really interested in is, um, let's see, um, uh, I don't know how much I want to read. 36, 36, 35? Well, it's 35 and 36, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how far I want to go back, because you should read this for yourselves. Let's go back to 30. How can one man chase a thousand, or two put ten thousand to flight, unless they're rock? has sold them, unless the Lord had given them up. The Lord, the Yahweh. For their rock is not like our rock, as even our enemies concede. Their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are filled with poison and their clusters with bitterness. Their wine is the venom of serpents, the deadly poison of cobras. Have I not kept this in reverse, or reserve and sealed it in my vaults? And then it's 35. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near. And their doom rushes upon them. And then, 36. The Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees their strength is gone and no one is left, slave or free. Look at this verse. Now, remember I told you this is rabbinic context. So when, the minute you saw this, you should be going to the Old Testament, right? And you know, you've, you've not memorized Deuteronomy, so you know exactly what he's talking about. 36, the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees their strength is gone and no one is left, slave or free. Does that sound like vengeance? Not vengeance on... It's, if there's vengeance, it's vengeance on the bad guys, the enemies, right? right? right. Not vengeance on Teen Hodos or the people of God. Yeah, the whole context of this is, is not the people of God, but rather others, right? But when we read it, or when we look at our translation, it looks like an, it looks like an attack on the people of God who, ha, who have not necessarily followed what they've done. And 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This isn't too far off, but let's look at it. Let's parse it. It is, is added, a fearful thing, fulberos, fulberos, frightful. The fall is literally to fall on or to fly onto, into ice, into is correct. The is added, cheer, the hand of the zeo theos, zeo theos. By the way, who is zeo, the zeo theos? Christ, Christ has died, Christ has risen, oh, Christ will come again. The Zeotheos is Christ. The Zeotheos is Christ. You know, the living God is the Christ. That is most evident in this. So here it is. This is literally what it says in a transliteration. Frightful be to fly into the hand living God. Or in a, trans, a literal translation, frightful to fly into the hands of the living God. Now, this is not, I mean, it fits within the context of what we just saw, right? But remember, the vengeance is against the others. The vengeance is against those that are oppressing Teen Hodos, quite obviously. Or, well, I don't want to go there. The vengeance is not, you know, if he's calling for anything, I don't think he's calling for vengeance, he's calling for vindication. The point he's trying to make is 
The point he's trying to make is, remember, we go back to the sacrifice. The sacrifice is sufficient, right? But in the Messianic era, we require a Thanksgiving sacrifice. So how are we going to do the Thanksgiving sacrifice? Paul solved the problem. These guys are probably Paul's buds, right? I think it's probably Apollos and maybe Barnabas, Mark, Barnabas and Apollos. One of those, it's two guys writing this, two people writing this that are teen hodos. And they probably agree with Paul. Unfortunately, who came from Jerusalem? The Apostolic Council came from Jerusalem. And what did the Apostolic Council say? Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. So you have a conundrum. So the authors aren't trying to prove Paul. That would be redundant and silly. They're trying to prove the point of Christ within the context of the Thanksgiving sacrifice. And they're trying to give him a means to do the Thanksgiving sacrifice. Paul said, go ahead, sacrifice to idols, right? No. Yep, what's, what's that? Yeah. Well, no, I, he, he, said, he said, he said, he <laughs> said, no, what no. I meant to say is, I said it wrong. He meant, I meant to say, he said, go ahead and eat mm -hmm. meat, sacrifice to well, idols. If you don't know, don't. Don't bother offend to, your brothers. Like, don't bother to say, hey, was this sacrifice to idols? Well, then I can't. Like, just go with it. Right, exactly. Because all meat in the ancient world was sacrificed to idols. All meat was sacrificed. Well, especially after destruction in Jerusalem, it had to be. <laughs> except for kosher butchers. So they probably had some kosher butchers there, right? But the big deal is that if you're following Paul... <laughs> you would have your Seder supper, your, your Thanksgiving sacrifice. And that's what we believe the northern, by the way, the northern Christians and Teen Hodas were doing. Because they were following Paul. But then now you have the Apostolic Fathers that are down in Alexandria, which, by the way, in case you didn't know, you knew this, right? There, was, there, there wasn't a huge break, but there was the southern Teen Hodos, the southern Christianity Orthodoxy, and there was the northern Orthodoxy. They were all good buddies. The guys who were not good buddies, right, are the Antioch Orthodox, which split into the Orthodox Church, and the other side, right? What's interesting is that Catholicism, well, Catholicism mostly was Northern Europe and the Northern Christians, where the Southern Christians became most, mostly Orthodox. And that's what you see, by the way, in, in Egypt right now, Orthodox Christianity, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I just have a question. Um, it seemed to me in the Old Testament that people were eating really not so much meat, except you know with the quail in the desert. I know, but mostly it seemed like they were eating flour with oil. You know, they baked into cakes and and maybe fish that were um, easily obtainable if they lived by the waterway. And um, and the rabbi that koshered our bakery said he could eat any place, you know, because we asked him, you know, what do you do if somebody invites you out? And he said, oh, he said, I get a salad. He said, I, I just don't eat meat. You know, I just, I just get a salad. And uh, he didn't worry about kosher butchers or anything. In fact, he thought it was ridiculous that some of his congregation would pay just, um, just a very expensive to order meat from that was butchered in New York or someplace else, you know, and ship it in. And he thought it was just ridiculous. He said there's a lot of things that we can eat and and not not mess with the kosher laws, you know. But I'm wondering how, how important it was that these people had meat or that they had it often, you know, because the Passover was once a year, you mm -hmm. know, and and they had festivals, what were there, four or five where they probably, you know, were in Jerusalem, but most people um, were eating off the land, you know, I would think. And so they're, they're eating vegetables, and that's what, um, what Daniel did, you know, when he was captive in, in Babylon. He said, um, give me, I don't want to eat the king's diet. He said, Could, let me just eat vegetables and, and drink water. And, and, and see how we go. And, and they were scared to death that he would he would be puny and die, and instead he looked healthier than the rest of them. You know? And well, so I'm wondering 
how important the meat thing is to these people. First of all, Daniel. Why did Daniel not eat the meat of the king? Because it was sacrificed to idols. Because it was sacrificed to idols. It has nothing to do with vegetables. It has nothing to do with water no, and vegetables. But no, but he knew he could survive without meat is what I'm saying. Well, 99.9% .9 of all humanity survive without meat. The problem was that I I'll challenge you. Go for a year without meat and see what happens the minute you smell meat cooking. Because the, <laughs> the scent of the sacrifice, meta-epithumia. Epithumia is the word meaning the scent of the sacrifice. People longed for meat. They longed for calories with fat because it was it was substantial and filled them and it was protein. And human beings love protein. As a matter of fact, if you want to make your children uh, semi-retarded, don't feed them protein and fats and they will become mentally retarded. We know that today that you have to give children high amounts of protein and fat to make their brains, you know, develop. That's one of the problems with India. India has huge amounts of children and people that are deprived of basic proteins. Even proteins from lentils and beans are not enough for the human being. So people would eat, yeah, they eat it. Six times a year, the Hebrews got meat. Whoa! And then we also know in the Thanksgiving sacrifices, right, which was the tithe. Right. They would save up their tithe, so, and they were allowed to. This is one of the huge things. When you brought your tithe, you didn't have to bring the like, goods to the temple. You were able, by law, and this was in the mission in the Talmud, early Talmud, you can, you know, the Talmud was written down in 100 AD, but before that, the Mishnah allowed you to turn your goods into money. And you could take those valuables, the money, you know, not until 600 AD, they'd really have money. So this is the inner age. Yeah. But they were bringing money to the temple where the temple money changers <coughs> turned that into temple money, and then they could buy goods to eat. They could buy liquor, they could buy, you know, <coughs> basically, if you remember Solomon, the reason they thought she was drunk was because that's what you did. You brought your money to the temple, you bought wine and alcoholic beverages, beer and meat, and then you sat down with your family and the priests and you ate a, a, a meal before the deity. So the whole world, the whole world revolved around meat and sacrifices. When we read Daniel, our immediate assumption is what? Daniel ate, w wouldn't eat because, well, why wouldn't he eat? He just wanted to eat vegetables. No, no it was the sacrifices, right? Yeah. Sacrifices drove the world. The Greeks, because of their, um, their um, sacrificial calendar and their festival calendar, they ate meat 12 times a year. So they were a more popular culture because the people would eat meat that often. But to eat meat was difficult. That's why they ate mostly baked, you know, or baked, baked is hard. They would eat, they would literally take pancakes, mix them with oil, and cook them, right, to make right. them edible. Right. But you remember in Ruth? Yeah. They, were, they were roasting kernels and eating them. That's all they had. They would get fish because fish was not considered meat. And you, could, you didn't have to sacrifice to eat it. You had to sacrifice to eat birds. And by the way, eating off the land like hunting, today, can a Jewish Orthodox person eat meat that's been hunted? I don't know. No, because it's not killed kosher. It's, it was not killed kosher. And by the way, your rabbi that was doing you, I hope he has his, still has his rabbi card, because if an Orthodox uh, heard that, he would not have his rabbi card very much longer. He's gone. Well, He's left us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but he was he was head of the Hebrew congregation as opposed to the temple that he despised because they didn't even have a kosher kitchen. How could that be? <laughs> well, remember, there's there's three types. There's I know. The, well, he was, he the was reform the, Orthodox. The middle one, yeah. yeah. I don't think we have too many of the <laughs> Orthodox, yeah. yeah. The real Orthodox. Yeah. The real Orthodox, yeah. yeah. But he did keep kosher. In order to keep kosher, he, would, uh, he was a guest and didn't have his own meat. And he would eat a salad. You know? But to, to gain, to grab a hold of this cultural issue, right, what we have to do is take off our cultural blinders. 
We eat meat every day. And by the way, we knew in Acts, what did the early teen hodos do according to Acts? They sacrificed every day. They were in the temple every day. Why was Paul asking for money for them? No. It was because it, it's because they were unable to continue the sacrifices without external help. So he went around to Christians all over the world and said, Hey, we've got to continue the Thanksgiving sacrifices in Jerusalem. Because the rabbi said, the rabbis, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Torah say, the prophecy says that in the age of the Messiah, the, the required sacrifice is the Thanksgiving sacrifice. Because all the other sacrifices have been completed by Christ. That's the message of Hebrews. So they were keeping, they were sacrificing every day. And if you're sacrificing every day, what are you doing? You run through a lot of money and you're eating a lot to meat. Because remember, animals were very expensive. Very expensive in that day. So this is huge. They come to Alexandria and what? They, they have an illegal temple. They can't legally sacrifice. They might be able to eat kosher meat. But it, is kosher meat the same as the sacrifice? No. It's kosher meat, so you can eat it. But what is the point of eating the Eucharist or the Thanksgiving sacrifice? Sharing the meal with the deity. It's sharing the meal with the deity. It's sharing a meal with Christ. We still do this, right? The reason we're taking it, you know, is to share. And by the way, we believe that by taking the Eucharist, what happens? Our sins are forgiven. We're re reunited with Christ in his spirit, right? We're taking the body and blood of Christ. Physically, we believe this, right? And so those in that period, do you think their belief was any less than yours? And yet it was to meet. Today we don't do meat because of John Christophanum. John Christophanum solved this issue for us. Do you know this was an issue? This was an issue from this time from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it was an issue up to 300 A.D. when John Christophanum finally solved the problem for Christianity. There was huge turmoil because of this issue. Let's look at uh, 32. Um, in 32 it says, Remember those earlier days after you'd received the light. Remember those earlier days after you'd received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. And here's what the parsing it. Let's see parse this. But day. Day is but. Call to remembrance is Anna Minesco. Recollect the to former Proteran, the previously Hermea days in which Tos, which is pretty good, after ye were photizio to shed rays, ye endured Hupomino to stay under Hupomino to stay under. A is added. Great, uh, uh, you could you could leave A in there, but A is added. Where great Paulus much fight, anathelesis, uh, athelesis, a struggle of afflictions, a pathema, something undergone. Here is a literal translation. But reflect the previously days in which you shed rays to stay under much struggle, something undergone. And here's a, a literal translation trying to translate this. But reflect the previous days in which you should raise to stay under much struggle, something undergone. Okay. It's, it's in your translation. How did you shed rays? Worshiping. Lighting candles. What's that? Lighting candles in the worship. Precisely. But why would they be lighting candles in a worship? Now, we know the Jews do, but... Who does that mitzvah? Who is the only group that can do the mitzvah of the light? Women. Women. Yeah. Remember? The women are the only ones allowed to do the mitzvah of the light. And the reason is because they are the highest peak of creation. The XX chromosome, perfect. The X, X the woman, is the perfect last end of creation, according to Orthodox Judaism. And they are allowed to do, they, there are certain mitzvahs they don't have to do, and there are certain mitzvahs that they are allowed to do. 
Men in Judaistic thought are not allowed to do certain mitzvot that women can do. And one of them is the ceremony of the light. However, this isn't necessarily that ceremony. Although we could take it for that ceremony, but I don't think it is. This is ceremony. Remember Jesus said, do not hide your light under a bushel? That is the mysterion. Now, the Christians had already been influencing and infiltrating the Mysterions. And one of the things that the Mysterions did is they would go in with, their, with lights under a bushel and they would reveal them. you got to take this totally from a concrete standpoint. And this is the Mysterion worship of the early Christians. So what they're saying, is, what do you think they're saying? When did, and, and when they say it shed light, they don't mean this euphemistically. They literally shed light. When do you think they did this ceremony? Well, they, they would worship at night in times when they couldn't be found out because they were persecuted. And they would worship in Mithras. All the, all the temples to Mithras were caves. underground caves. Yes, that's why the catacombs. The first church they found in Antioch, guess where it is? It's underground because the Christians worshipped at night to prevent being discovered. And they also did the shedding of the light. And the one of the things they believed that came from was Jesus Christ said, show your light. Well, that's what the Mithrans did, but the Christians took it over. So the sh shining of the light, now we would say symbolically, but, how, but remember, we believe you get baptized, right? And, well, actually, we believe first you go through communion, then you're baptized. In their day, they baptized you, and then they did basically, not communion, but they did the um, training. They trained you, right? Mm -hmm. They trained you. And when you were fully part of the community, apparently they did the shining light thing. We'll get to this. Uh, not next week. Next week I will be gone, but the week after next uh, we will continue. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. But we are on Grand Baby Watch. Yeah. <laughs>